You know, we hear a lot about process. And for some, that's a dirty word. Process sounds structured and ugh, like, do we really want process? That sounds so rigid and annoying and stale. Well, guess what? Let's talk about how process can really help. I had Alistair Esam. He's the CEO of Process Bliss. That's a SaaS company that helps you incorporate processes into your business. He's also sold his company in the past, a previous company, and he's written a book, The Dirty Word, which refers to process. He shares a lot of great insights and things that are very actionable for startup founders. I think you're really going to like it. Check it out. Welcome to Sastery in the Making, the podcast that features the people who made the software world what it is today and the leaders who are shaping the future of technology. Here's your host, Matt Wallach. Yes, welcome. I am Matt Wallach. Welcome, welcome to Sastery in the Making. Really excited to have you here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're on the podcast, super, super cool show today. And I'm delighted to welcome my special guest, Alistair Esam. Alistair, how you doing? Very well, thanks, Matt. Well, thanks for inviting me on the show. For sure. I'm really excited to have you here. Alistair's live from just outside London, one of my favorite cities in the world. So let me tell you about Alistair. He is a super, super smart dude. He's the founder and CEO of Process Bliss. It's a SaaS tool that centralizes processes and procedures and executes workflows and manages tasks to help organizations become outstanding. He's also formerly the founder and CEO at eShare, where he had a successful exit, and he's author of The Dirty Word. It's a book that you definitely got to check out. It's called The Dirty Word, and what it really, this book addresses the way we disregard creativity and disempower individuals as we scale businesses. So, Alistair, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you, Matt. Absolutely. Well, tell me, what's going on with you lately and what's coming up? So, um, well, I guess I guess what we're doing at the moment, um, in fact, I probably need to give you some background to, to kind of cover that. Um, so I, I exited my previous business uh, a couple of years back. And um, in that business, this was a SaaS business. It was a SaaS business before SaaS was a word. Um, I set it up in 2004 and um, I just thought it was cool to rent software. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't the term SaaS hadn't ever been, um, when, when SaaS came out, I was like, oh, that's what we do. We do that SaaS thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I bootstrapped it as well. So I grew a little bit more slowly than you, than you, than you would do these days, but, um, but we, we, I went on a journey where we went from sort of 10 to 75 people. Um, and, uh, we, I was working sort of back when we were 10 people, I was working 80 hours a week and I just couldn't understand how to scale this business because I was into everything, making everybody's life miserable. I was frustrated. I was miserable working these long hours. And I, I went on this journey to a point when basically when I sold the business, I was out in two weeks. I, I wasn't running it anymore. I had a team that I didn't have a CEO. I just, the team ran it for me. And I was like literally working maybe one or two days a week. Um, and process, which, which people hate often, was the key to me kind of unlocking that journey from working those 80 hours to, to working, you know, 14 hours, say. And I, and I did that with the same team as well. So that I kept the same team all the way through. So and and I, I see people now, um, and I CEOs, and I see meet a lot of CEOs, and this is like an endemic problem where people are just so into their businesses and so involved in their businesses that they can't um, they can't get away from it and they can't trust anybody and they make their staff's life miserable and they just need to let go. And and for me, process was the key. Um, and so what I'm doing now is a long-winded answer, but what I'm doing now is. Um, I set up Process Bliss to kind of take a software product to market, which I developed in my old business, to kind of help um, these businesses out of this mess. But it needed more than that. So I've had to write a book. Um, we're doing a lot of other stuff and podcasts and all this stuff to get this message out there. The process, people get process wrong. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to it. But but realistically, that's that's my my, my number one focus. Um, other things I'm doing, I'm an investor in 15 other SaaS startups. Um, so I get to meet a lot of CEOs and work with a lot of startup CEOs and, and see how they look at it and, and watch the mistakes they make. And well, most of them are doing a pretty good job actually. So, um, so yeah, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment and what I'm doing. It's process bliss, promoting the book and, you know, these are the investments in these companies. I love it. I think we're in very similar positions. And I've also gone through that same situation in the mid 2000s, started a company that was a SaaS company and grew it and exited. 
And uh, I also help other SaaS companies now try and find the same success. So I love that we're, we're, we're doing the same sort of thing, helping people. And I really, really think your story is amazing. Um, and the fact that you were an actuary and then you said, hey, I want to come up with this company, you bootstrapped it. So what told you back then when you were an actuary that you needed to have a company that solved problems? Well, um, so yeah, I was an actuary. Actually, an interesting story. My my daughter's um, my daughter. You know, the kids do an analysis of their profile at school, and they, and it tells them what what they're going they should be when they're older. And my daughter's came back and it said number one actuary. And I'm like, God, no, no, you don't want to do that <laughs> job. That job is that job in hell on earth. It's miserable. It's boring. <laughs> so I went. I was an actuary because I was good at maths and it was well paid. And um, God, I wanted to get out of it. It was such a, the people were nice and that sort of aspect was nice, but I, I just found it really dull. And what I found was, um, I guess I, I guess I found this, I'd grown up on a farm and farmers are very entrepreneurial. They're very free people. They can come and go as they want. They work hard, but they do it according to their agenda. And all of a sudden I was like strapped in a seat from nine to five, told to stare at a monitor and do work. And I thought, you know, OK, this is interesting. I'm getting paid for it. But it started to occur to me that this was kind of like a form of slavery. It was like it was sort of like, you know, you, and we do you think about it. We get people we they need to make money. So we put them in a seat. We make them stare at a monitor. And that and that's and I think COVID has done a lot to break this down. But um, but we don't respect their lives. We say, you know, well, you're here, you're ours. Um, you know, you can go home and have your own time. But when you're, you're here, you're ours. You can't do what you want. And I, I just wanted to break free of that. So I mean, the number one focus in setting up a business was not to make money. It was it was probably freedom. Um, but I also saw a business opportunity and a business a business kind of issue that needed solving. I worked in pensions at the time, and and that's where the business eShare come from. And it came from the fact that pension fund boards just were terrible. They were you know not disorganized, paid lip service to their roles. They just didn't mm -hmm. didn't treat it seriously. Pension fund boards in the UK are a bit like company boards. So I, I went after them and, and basically we were the guys that got them to use iPads and got them to use technology to be better connected and to govern their organizations better. And then that led through to doing hospitals, to doing companies, to doing universities, to doing every type of organization that had a board. Um, and that was what Isha did. We provided you know electronic board paper solutions um, and, and, and a lot more than that. But um, yeah, so, and, and I guess what was interesting about that sort of journey was I set up my own company because I wanted to be free. And then I, you know, going back to the story I just mentioned, I found myself trapped working 80 hours a week in the new company because I couldn't trust anybody to do anything. <laughs> so um, I, had, I had another trap to escape. And I, I think I'm, um, I don't feel like I'm in a trap now. I think I escaped that one and um, I feel comfortable now. I feel free. So yeah, I finally got there. So yeah, well, I guess. I I, I, I think it's amazing. We talk about it. It's and it's something I work on with my clients as well. You, you know, as, sometimes as founders, as CEOs, we get caught working in the business too much instead of working on the exactly. business. And it sounds like you figured out how to step away from working in the business eighty hours a week, like you said, not trusting your team, to now working on the business, having a team take care of it while you manage the team. Yeah, Is that right. Have, yeah, uh, spot on. I mean. Once I'd figured this out and we started to got it, get it in place and, you know, process was the key, but then it was all about, you know, enjoying that, that transition. And all of a sudden I started to trust my team and I trusted my team because they had process basically. They had process and I just thought, well, you've got process now, you're doing a great job. Um, and uh, you're looking after the process and owning it. And, you know, everything's going absolutely brilliantly. So I trust and trust this trust grew and grew. And I used to say to my PA, who's, who's still my PA at the time, She's really an EA. She doesn't like the word PA, but um, I used to say to my EA, um, you know, that the less I do, the better it gets. So like I, I'd stop doing something, let someone else do it, feel guilty for letting them do it. They would love the new, the responsibility and the autonomy. And I'd think, well, it's just one less job for me. I can, I can actually go and do something more interesting now. And so the less I do, the better I, it gets. And, and I see so many CEOs who can't get to that point. They are just so they can't trust anybody with anything and they're just so frustrated with their staff. And I, I that's my objective to try and unlock that for them. So, yeah. That's a good objective because that's when scale really happens. That's when impact really happens. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you're helping them with it. I want to just wrap up what we're talking about with eShare. 
What was it like selling your business? I know a lot of people who listen to this show, they are software founders. They're wanting to get to that exit point. So what was it like selling it? And what was the hardest part of that process? So it was tough, actually. Um, so I, because I bootstrapped it, it actually took me 14 years, 13, 14 years. I mean, you, everybody spends time in the wilderness as well. They, no one tells you about that, right? So, you know, you spend time in the wilderness with nothing. But it took me um, it took me 14 years if I go from very start to very finish to grow it. And you, when you've made it successful, it becomes your identity and it becomes what you are. And I... I remember I sold it three times, really, and then each time I pulled out. This, the second time I pulled out was, I mean, literally, I sold it to our biggest competitor in the U.S., and um, they were doing their due diligence. Uh, and I'll give you an example. When you do your due diligence, this I don't know whether everyone does it like this, but they, they sent over 20 people from New York, um, 20 senior people, basically their whole senior team, and it was 20 people. It's huge. And they wow. got this hotel for two days. They all flew business class from New York, hotel for two days, and there they are. And my team turn up, which was about six people. The advisors turn up. So we've got 30 people in the room, and they're quizzing you about your business. They're asking everybody about stuff and, and, and everything. And on the first night, we went out for dinner, and my wife was there. And I said to my wife, and I've been thinking about this all day, I was looking around the room. And the thing is, in the room, everybody's gaining something. So, you know, the, the guys that are buying the business are going to get big bonuses. Um, the, uh, the, my team are going to get like a, a, a payout cause they, they've got a share scheme and my advisors are getting, you know, three, three, four percent or whatever the number is, their advisors are getting some, some sort of huge sum. Um, so, you know, they're in for millions of pounds and all this, all this is going on. And you're looking around the room and think, I'm the only one losing anything here because I'm losing something. I, I own this business anyway. So whether I sell it or not, I, it's like when you sell a car, you don't make money, right? You just get the cash for what the car's worth. So I'm selling it for what it's worth, as I believed. Uh, I wasn't doing some sort of amazing deal with Google to, to sell it for 50 times what it's worth. So I'm the one losing because I'm actually losing my identity and I'm losing that. And I'm gaining something as well. But it, it was like that. So I said to my wife that night, we went out for dinner. And on the way to dinner, we we're talking. And I said, I'm not sure about all this. I don't know whether I want to do it. And she just said, well, you don't have to, do you? And I went, well well, they've, they've just spent hundreds of thousands on due diligence. They've shipped 20 people over from New York. Probably would be a bit poor form to pull out now. She said, well, you haven't signed anything. You know, it's not done. So I it took a week of sleepless nights, and then I rang up the CEO, which I, actually I could use this opportunity to apologize to Brian Stafford, the CEO, <laughs> <laughs> um, and Michael Stanton, the CFO, because I rang them up, and they were great about it. I said, look, where have you got to with this? How, he said, oh, I told the board yesterday. It's all going through. <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm pulling out, Brian. I'm sorry. Um, and I pulled out. And so, I mean, that, that might give you a flavor for what it's like selling your business. And I was absolutely in, in pieces about it all. Um, and in the end, those guys gave me time. And I ended up selling it to them six months later. Um, and it gave me time to think it through, get comfortable with it. But I think, you know, if I answer your question, again, long-winded answer, but I think it's the losing your identity is really the the hardest bit the rest is just mechanics is it because it was your baby and i yeah. we we talk a lot about that as you built it you put all your sweat and years and tears into it it was your baby right well it's your baby but the thing i think it depends on what your personal motives are in life so i mentioned freedom was a driver at the start but what that business became to me was pride and and then pride can be a bad thing as well but i mean i didn't see it as a bad thing i was proud of what i built and I think there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, people sort of sometimes criticize pride. I was really proud of it. And it was my accomplishment in life to build this thing. And it was very evident to anybody who met me. Oh, you're the guy that runs that business in town. You know, oh, you've got the offices there, you know. And, and you felt like maybe that's that. And I did actually feel, no, you should let that go because that could be a little bit unhealthy. But even if you, whether you, you consider it healthy, unhealthy, letting it go is really, really hard. Um, you know, it must be like it must be how sportsmen feel when they're over the hill, sort of thing. You know, you, you know, you you you're not going to achieve that ever again. Well, you, I I hope I can achieve it again. So, you know, we're building the new business and it's going well. So I've gone and done that. But you know, maybe that's not the best analogy. But it was it was that aspect to it. I think that made it hard. sure. That makes sense. So let's talk about that new business you founded, Process Bliss. So <laughs> what exactly does that do, and who does it serve? So so yeah, it, it's basically checklist software 
combined with a company-wide to-do list. And it serves small and medium-sized businesses. So anything from well, one person up to um, you know, 250 people. And it, it's really when those businesses, when they're trying to scale and they need to put process in place and they, they don't need sort of massive automation. They don't need complicated systems. They don't want to kill creativity. They don't want to kill empowerment in their business. They want to encourage that. And what I, I developed it over the years and years within, within eShare and it, it became such an important part of that business that, that I, that, that's where the product came from. And I wanted to take it to those businesses. And I, I think the, the key thing was when people put process in place, they, you, they, they naturally instinctively want to control everybody and it doesn't work. It, you know, it, they, that people will rebel against it, will go around it. What you've got to do is like treat people like they're smarter than process. You know, so if people want to, so we actually actively encourage people to stray from the process, but then we ask them why they're strayed. We encourage that kind of culture because when you find out why people aren't following the process, you actually learn something about how you could do things better because people are, are generally quite smart. And, and on the other occasion where they're not, at least you know they've strayed and you can kind of educate them to how not to. But, um, and I think the reason why it's a company-wide to-do list, which is where we've gone in the recent sort of over the recent year as well, is that CEOs and 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 you know, founders and and their management team they see process as key to the business. But if you work in a business, you don't see process. If you're if you're Brian in accounts, what you see is I've got to do that. I've got to. You don't see an employee onboarding process. You say I've got to set up payroll. You don't see. Um, you don't see a, a kind of customer onboarding process. You see invoice client. You don't see monthly management accounts. You see, uh, I need to do an export of some data from zero or something. So what they see is a to-do list. So what we do is we almost, it's almost like a little bit of a Trojan horse. We, we put process in place, but staff don't see process. Employees don't see process. They see a to-do list. And so we've, we've developed some really cool to-do list functionality as well. That to be honest, I use it. I love it. It makes my life so much easier. Um, and um, yeah, putting the two together is the magic that makes it work. So that's kind of what Process Bliss is. Yeah, that's great. Now I know that it, for a lot of companies, those early days are the hardest. What did you do there to kind of help get Process Bliss off the ground and gain early traction? So um, I don't like to think of myself as an arrogant person, but I think I was a little bit arrogant when I sold my business, and I think I actually made. A load of, um, I think I actually made a load of mistakes that I never made. It didn't even make the first time around, right? <laughs> so, um, so what did I? What did I do? Was your question what did I do right or what did I do wrong? <laughs> I, 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 what did you do right? What helped it get off the ground and gain early traction? Okay, so, so I think, I think if I answer, I mean, what I did wrong, but I should have done. You can say I, what I, you did wrong. That helps too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, I think the key things, key things are. Um, you know, have, an, have a minimum viable product. So I went out and built something really fancy because I've got the budget to, and we're going to, you know, I knew what people wanted. And um, so I built this really fancy product and I shouldn't have done. I should have just built a minimum viable product, got it out there and, 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 and uh, you know, adapted it because we didn't get product market fit right first time. And you waste a hell of a lot of cash if you develop a product and then have to change it later because you were nowhere near the mark. Um, we thought people would sign up online uh, people won't sign up online for what we're doing. So we need to add a, an implementation, a consulting type element to what we do. So, you know, I should have I should have got to that quicker and more cheaply. So, I mean, that's, that's if I, yeah. Um, I don't know, the, the other things are, our marketing approach wasn't 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 quite right. Um, but these, I think the thing is about this, I'm, I'm quite beating myself up. The thing about this is it's a journey and you've got to learn. And you're not going to get everything right first time. The mistakes are what teach you what the correct way to do things are, right? So, um, so you know, however you do it, if you think you could do it perfectly each time, you'd have to be a really, really smart person to be able to achieve that. No um, kidding. I learned yeah. a lot between my first company and my second company. It helped me do a lot of things better in my second company. What about you? From your first company, eShare, were there things that you were able to take from the learnings there and apply it to Process Plus? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and it, and it relates to what we do now, the biggest thing was the way that I just empower people and trust people and value people and, and recognize people's differences. I mean, when I set up my first company, I was in my early 30s, um, and I, 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 I kind of 
I didn't really fully appreciate, you know, the different talents that people brought to the table. I didn't really fully appreciate diversification, you know. And I think uh, Matthew Syed's done a great book called Rebel Ideas on Diversification. And um, just talking about the fact that, you know, we used to think diversification was something we should do because, you know, it was it was right from an equality point of view. But actually, diversification is a is a, is a, is a brilliant thing to bring into your business and to bring different people with different perspectives. Because those people really annoy you in meetings because they don't think like you. And they don't agree with you and they say things and you go, what, why, why are they, why are we going down this route? But actually, if you can be patient, that there's magic in what they say, because they're saying things that you would never get to. Um, so the way I manage my team like that, the, the freedom I give them to kind of crack on and do it, you know, I, you often think you know best, especially when you're younger and, and that kills people's, you know, creativity and autonomy. Um, so just let them get on with it. When they say something like, they, they're going to they do something you don't dis, you disagree with the approach you think it's a waste of time you don't kind of score points you don't try and tell them it's wrong just let them do it and see where they get to because quite often they'll prove you wrong um so i think the, you know the biggest thing for me is is that kind of and, and it makes for a nice company if you do that as well because it makes for a company where people are you know they are they're trusted they're empowered they feel like they they, they pass that on to the people that work for them it makes it makes a good culture and culture trumps everything. Uh, I totally agree. I hire for culture myself. It's really important to make sure that the people you're bringing in are diverse, are able to come in and not be just yes people and not just agree with everything you say, because guess what? We don't know everything. And it's great to have different mindsets, great to have different viewpoints and to empower them to want to speak up, to want to do it. And you're right. I love what you said that it's going to annoy you because they don't always agree with you. But that's the point, right? If it's just you, then your company won't be as strong as if you have the the you know it's the the two minds are greater than one kind of kind of mindset here. So I love that, and and I want to talk about the book, the dirty word. Yeah. So it sounds super interesting. I read through it, read the premise. What prompted you to write that book? So we we set process plus up. We set up the software, and I didn't want to write a book, but my team kept saying, Alistair, the the topic is bigger than just a software product. You know, we, we're having to educate people about the way the way that process is implemented is wrong because people want to use it to control. We, we get clients coming to us and they want to control and they don't understand why they should empower instead of control, why the result of implementing process is not is not kind of is not kind of uh, this massive oversight. It's actually having trust. And um, and so uh that was what that was really what drove it and i think it, it's a general just such a a misunderstanding and that's where the word the title dirty word came from it took me a while to figure it out and i i, I think it's in my, my opening chapter but i went down to um i went down to i have an office upstairs in my, my house and i went down into the kitchen and my wife's there with a friend of hers and the friend starts going hey here he comes mr process mr routine mr boring and i thought that's not me what are you talking about? You know, I fly helicopters, I race cars, I do all this stuff. You call me Mr. Boring, <laughs> Mr. Routine, Mr. And what she didn't get was, well, she basically just heard the word process. She knew the word was process, and she just decided to go off on that. And then my wife joins in, and I'm thinking, well, you know me better than that. So, um, and it's the fact that when you say process, people just go boring, control, routine, status quo. And to me, it's the exact opposite. It's what's it, it can be. What makes you achieve wonderful things with your business. If you have a process, it's the only. If you want to have the most fanciful, fun recruitment kind of process, where pe employee onboarding, where people are presented with you know fun stuff as they join, they get gifts, they get they get kind of their favorite biscuit on their desk when they turn up. If you want all those nice touches in a business and all that stuff that makes it fun to be in a business, you need to have process. And process enables those things because in any other business without process, people think of these great ideas. But then they they go they last for about three months and then they die, um, so it was kind of like that misconception, uh, and I wanted to kind of try to change people's perception of process to to what I see it as. I'm glad, and I agree. Some people think of process as kind of a bad word, and I I love you called it the dirty word because it sounds so rigid and structured, and who wants to like follow that? But it is what helps the business grow and thrive and become, <clears throat> excuse me, those amazing things where, like you said, you get biscuits on your desk and people come together and the culture becomes very strong. That's the 
the driving force that allows a company to get to that point. Yeah, I, I, ought to, I, I ought totally to agree. Warn you, Matt. So I was going to say, I ought to warn you that if you if you search for Dirty Word on Amazon, you will find my book, but you'll also find some other books. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you have to sure. be careful. I don't know if I should be entering that into my search history. <laughs> um, what uh, wrapping up based on your experience running a couple software companies and writing the book, what advice do you have for early stage software founders, Alistair? So I, I think there's loads of stuff you can throw in there, you know, like um, uh, have, having a, you call it a niche, we call it a niche, but having those sort of things, you know, um, the letting go and everything. But the one thing, it's a question that crops up a few times and I've thought it through quite a lot. And I watched a lady called Karen Brady talk at an event once and she's a really impressive lady. She She's now um, chairman of uh, West Ham United Football Club, which is the most impressive football club in the UK. Not the best, but the only one that doesn't have like a Russian owner that's probably billions of pounds. You know, it's, they actually make money. The only football club that makes money. And she actually turned around another football club, Birmingham City, I think it was. Um, and she's in a... What, a woman being in charge of a football club is, is pretty unknown. It certainly was unknown when she started doing it. Um, it's a very male dominated atmosphere and she, she's really impressive. And she was asked that question. I thought her answer was the, was pretty much my answer. And it was, she said, it, it isn't, it isn't intelligence and it isn't kind of hard work and it isn't all those things you'd think it would be. What you need to be successful is determination and it's determined, determine people that make it. And I thought that is just spot on because it's so easy to give up and it's so easy to kind of, you know, to, because it, people think a friend of mine sort of says, you know, he's, he's been running his business 10 years and he's going really well now. They're turning over 5 million, um, you know, growing at sort of 50% a year. And he says, everyone thinks we're an overnight success. He says, but you know, we're not, they don't know that there was 10 years of absolute misery where we were going nowhere. And, and you just got to be determined to keep going and see it through. And that the one tip I would give is, you know, if you only want to make it, um, you've just got to keep going and keep thinking that, you know, every time you, you like building a mountain and you don't really know how much you're contributing some of the time, you know, you know, you, you're doing some good towards building that mountain, but you don't know how much you're doing. You just got to keep going and, 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 and you know that you're doing good, you're adding value and eventually the success will come. Um, so kind of, that would be where I'd be on that. I love it. I think it's great advice and uh, absolutely super, super cool. The determination is critical and I completely agree with that. Well, Alistair, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom, your insights. How can people get to know you? How can they find you and learn more about the book and the company? Thanks, Matt. I um, really, really appreciate that. So um, yeah, I mean, actually, the, the favorite thing for me to do, if you go to, if you go to my website, which is alistareason.com, you find my, my, my phone number at the bottom left. It doesn't take calls, that number. It only takes text messages. But my favorite message is, you know, text me because it's just nice to make personal contact. I'm always, always in, if you listen to this podcast, you've got this far. You keep, you've probably got some thoughts on process. Would love to hear what, what they are um, and have a bit of a chat with you about it. So my, my number one would be that. Um, on top of that, obviously, processbliss.com, um, you, you can go to as well. But but yeah, no, no, te text me on that number at the bottom of my um, at the bottom of my website, alistreason.com. I love it. That's a great idea. We'll put all that into the show notes as well so that everybody sees it. But fantastic, Alistair. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing everything with us. Pleasure. Wonderful, Matt. Lovely to meet you. Absolutely. Likewise. And thank you for listening. Thanks for watching everybody out there. Make sure you're subscribed to the show. Hit the subscribe button right now. That way you're going to get notified of everything that's coming up. You're going to see more great leaders and creators like Alistair so you can learn from their wisdom and apply it in your own business. So thank you very much for coming and we will see you next time. Take care. Yeah.